to earn the same amount as their male counterparts make in one year. Women have to work one year and part of the next year, too. I mean, aren't you more prone to be scatterbrained? I mean, you're just all over the place. I did write about Ariana Grande, and I did write uh -huh. about the abusive, bigoted, Those pieces were a little smarter than your piece about threatening the, the sovereignty States. of a whole religion. All right, I got to go. You should stick to the thigh-high boots. You're better at that. Most women are happier at home. They are pretending that they like working, and they're not making money because they don't stay all night at the office. Hi again. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm back. I'm Katie Kerr. I <laughs> hope you remember that. Um, it's my pleasure to be sitting here with four top female leaders, real badasses, Carolyn Tastad, Minister M Miriam Monseth, Michelle Romano, and Sukender Singh Cassidy. Please welcome them, you guys. <laughs> I wish I could stay and have a drink with these ladies. They're so great, but I have to get back to New York immediately following this panel, but you all should have a drink with these ladies. <laughs> so we're yeah, going to have a conversation it. about some of the cliches or stereotypes, what we're calling myths that hold women in the workforce back. The first myth is there are not enough qualified female candidates for the top jobs. So Sue Kinder, you started board list, the board list, which is it helps create a network of women candidates for company board seats. And before we talk about that a little bit more, let's zero in on this notion that there are not enough qualified female candidates in general. I thought I'd give you the first shot at busting that myth, so <laughs> knock yourself out. Okay, so uh, the board list, just by way of background, uh, is a curated talent marketplace where CEOs and senior executives with board experience nominate great women they know for board service, and companies can come, CEOs, on the other hand, can come and find great board members for their own startup, public board, private board, nonprofit board. Uh, so the reason we created the platform was to dispel this exact notion that there are not enough qualified women for boards. Uh, what did we find? Number one, I think we should just acknowledge not only are there many qualified women, the problem we have is that you may not know them. So if you look at uh, male board members and male CEOs who we would agree dominate boardrooms, their own networks are themselves homogeneous. So what you really need to do is say, <laughs> is really dispel the notion by saying, there may not be enough women that you know, <laughs> but let me tell you, there are enough women. And so when you crowdsource uh, talent on a global basis, what you find is women are running large companies, women are running large divisions. You know, women, while they are ascending the CEO seat, have more than enough capabilities to serve in the boardroom. But you need to change your lens for where you go look for board talent and stop looking to your first order network and thinking that that's enough. And not so just board talent, all talent, all right? All talent. Mm -hmm. So if you say to them, uh, if you say to somebody, a woman, hey, do you know any great women? You know what? They come up with twice as many names as the men do. And when you ask a man, he says, well, I don't know anyone. Just because you don't know anyone doesn't mean they don't exist. Mm -hmm. So you need to be willing to set a targets around a pipeline, to go to your second order networks, to use the platforms that are available, whether it's the board list or otherwise, to be able to look outside your natural and rather homogeneous network to find it. But they certainly exist. You know, many of you might have noticed, if you're observant, that Sue Kinder and I traded shoes before the panel. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, just in case you're confused. Okay, Carolyn, you've done a lot of thinking about this. I couldn't deal with the heels. They were just too high. But you've done a lot about uh, thinking about this issue of Procter & Gamble. And if, in fact, there are, as Sue Kinder uh, asserts, plenty of qualified female candidates, why is this myth so persistent? Is it simply an excuse uh, for men for maintaining the status quo? Well, I, I agree 100% with Sikinder. There are plenty of women. And the way that we approach this is we say it really takes two things to address this. One is intentionality, and certainly Prime Minister Trudeau spoke about that this afternoon. Uh, it took great intentionality and planning to get to a gender equal cabinet, and Minister Monsat can talk much more about that. The second thing that it takes is simple math. You gotta know what number you're going after. Uh, so when it was the cabinet, 30 people, we needed 15 women. Uh, I take the example of the Fortune 500. So there are 5% of women on the Fortune 500, 5% of women CEOs. If we have to go from 5% to 50%, oh my goodness, that's a tenfold increase. That sounds terribly daunting. Or we can look for 225 women. 
225 women, we can find them. And so breaking it down into simple math with very intentional planning and intentional effort is part of the way we get at this because there are more than enough qualified women. Miriam, you're the minister for the status of women in Canada. The liberal government has been criticized by its opponents for having a 50-50 male-female cabinet and for trying to implement diversity targets. Now, it, you know, it's great that you all have achieved this. At, and and at, I think, thankfully, because you have an enlightened prime minister, but how can you give these kinds of goals real teeth? You know, how can you codify this? It's, it's one thing to have the right intention, but how do you execute this? Well, Katie, first of all, it's a privilege to be on this traditional territory that the Mitchisagas of the new credit have called home for generations in a space filled with great women and their allies. The fact that the Prime Minister of Canada has said 50-50 uh, gender balance cabinet makes sense. It's about doing the right thing at the time because it was 2015 and it was time. But having greater diversity, more women in positions of power and influence is also the smart thing to do. It's about increasing the bottom line in the private sector. It's about making better decisions in the public sector. And it's about ensuring that our sons and daughters and genders in between see role models that look like them, that talk like them, that they relate to, so that they start to say, hey, if she can do it, I can do it too. So. There's some who uh, are not thrilled with the idea of an equal number of qualified women being around the table with an equal number of qualified men. But there are many who recognize that it is time. And in Canada, we have an opportunity and an obligation to lead. And we've been thankfully given the political space by Canadians to do this work. And so we could legislate as one of uh, my colleagues uh, in another country said, we could legislate every road and every street in this country. But if Canadians aren't with us, that decision, that outcome will not be sustainable. So how? By ensuring that we communicate well, that the reason we're doing this is because it's good for the middle class. It's good for the economy. It's good for Canada to stay competitive, uh, to nurture the next generation of leaders, to be deliberate about seeking them out, to measure and ensure that we recognize that if it is not measured, it does not count. And the Prime Minister and his team did a good job recruiting a diverse slate of candidates leading up to the 2015 election. But ultimately, in a liberal democracy, these challenges and opportunities only exist because we have the political will of Canadians, and that will be uh, that will ensure the sustainability of our efforts. I mean, I think we're all totally jiggy with that, you know. And we <laughs> jiggy all. With that, are my you? <laughs> daughter said ten years ago, and she's like, "Mom, please stop saying that." Don't. But 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 you know, how do you enforce it? It's one thing. I mean. Everybody knows that it's good for the bottom line. It's good. We want to have role models. If you can't see it, you can't be it. But how do you ensure that it actually happens? For example, there's a Rooney rule that the, the man who owned the Pittsburgh Steelers said, if there is an opening in a coaching or managerial position, you must interview someone of color because he wanted to diversify the NFL. To me, that's a very concrete step. And I talked to some women in tech, and they said, we instituted the Rooney rule in our company and we increase the women in our company by 75 percent because you can't hire the people you don't interview mm -hmm. so what real steps can be taken to ensure this is happening ex other than good intentions and the fact that everybody in this room understands it's a good thing everybody in this room may understand that it's a good thing but as you mentioned kitty that is not the common held belief by everyone so part of our job is to lead by example so when you see women like christia freeland rocking it on the international stage and doing incredibly important work that's a social signal and canadians are behind that kind of leadership but i will give you an example of how we're addressing the lack of diversity around corporate boardrooms in Canada. About one in five seats around corporate board, uh, boardrooms in Canada are filled by women. You know this, I think all of, all of us recognize that it's a problem. It's not because there aren't enough great women. Absolutely, they're there. Uh, the challenge, though, can be addressed by the government. So we've introduced a new law 
It is now the law of the land that corporations need to have a certain percentage of women and certain diversity targets need to be met. If they're not able to comply with those standards that we've set, they need to explain it to, to, to the public, but also to their shareholders. And again, it's about doing the right thing and ensuring that the range of voices that need to be around the table are there. But it's also recognizing that it's an imperative for the Canadian economy. If we're going to stay competitive, those companies that have greater diversity, their, t their profit margins are 26% higher than those who don't. And Michelle, I'm going to get to you in two seconds, but Sue Kender, I, I recently read that there's a law being introduced in, in the states, right? In, in, well, California just passed a law around uh, board diversity, which is fantastic, but I think the point you just made about comply or explain, so one step short of quotas is comply or explain, which is set the targets, you need to show that you are progressing towards the targets, and if you're not, what is your explanation? So. Katie, while we talk about all of the positive things associated with why there should be more diversity in boardrooms or exec uh, circles, I think we should all recognize one of the great disruptors of the last 24 months has been shame. So, so I mean, if positive incentive won't get you there, the reality is that negative incentive, in fact, it works as well. I mean, I, it's not, you know, we don't really talk about it, but I think comply or explain quotas, the Me Too movement, and calling people into account uh, for not being good actors, in some ways is as progressive as trying to get there linearly. That's interesting because, you know, I interviewed Gina Davis about uh, more representation in film, and they are so uh, intent upon not shaming people and not pointing out people who don't do the right thing, and I guess that's sort of a philosophical choice for her organization, but I agree with you, it can be a very valuable tool, yeah, and, and I'm not above way, it. The board list never shames either, <laughs> but I would just say if we just if we were all honest with ourselves about whether or not we've seen more progress on women's issues in the last two years versus last six, whether it's entertainment, whether it's tech, whether it's Canada, I would just say negative incentive has also well. That's one of the reasons the Me Too movement has been so powerful when you think about it, because it's embarrassed and humiliated people as horrible as that is, but it's very effective. Okay, well, it's not necessarily horrible given their behavior, but anyway, that's yeah. another subject. <laughs> Michelle, yeah. uh, you're <laughs> hi, Michelle. You're an incredibly successful entrepreneur. I know you hire a lot of women. How do you feel when people say it's a pipeline problem? It, it's it's not a pipeline problem. You have to go look for those people and you have to go actively find those people. I mean, I love the stat on, you know, if people, if if you look at a job description, um, men need six out of the qualifications to apply and women feel like they need all 10 out of 10. I think that there isn't a pipeline problem. There is sometimes a bravery and a risk-taking issue with women where we need to be telling people from the earliest stage that it's okay to fail, it's okay to jump off the monkey bars, it's okay to apply for a job that you don't know everything for. I mean, I didn't know anything about any of the industries that I started a company with, but I knew that there was something to build there. And my personal way of tackling the pipeline issue that I care most about is access to funding for entrepreneurs and for women. I mean, today the stats in Canada and in the US are terrible. It's 2% or 3% of women get venture capital funding. And I know that there are way more qualified women businesses. And so instead of you know, I, I built a company around this. I said, we're going to build ClearBank. We're not going to look at your personal credit score. We're not going to do meetings that are subject to all these personal biases. We're literally going to have you plug in your online data, your bank account, your credit card processing account, your Facebook ad spend account. You look at that and then make decisions. And you know what happened? It was magic. We funded something like five times more women than the average VC would because we're looking at the data. We're getting incredible results out of that. Um, and we're really going to prove that, that there are incredible women to fund, but you do have to do a better job going to find them. All right. That's great. So moving on to myth number two, women lack confidence and ambition. Carolyn, <laughs> it seems counterintuitive to me that this is actually a myth because we've heard for years that women are less confident than men that women, girls, lose confidence when they go through puberty or become adolescents. And in fact, to Michelle's point, that HP study that she pointed out, men apply for jobs when they have 60% of the skills required, and women apply only when they have 100% of the skills required. And when things don't go well, men blame external factors, women blame themselves. So doesn't that suggest, Carolyn, that women do indeed lack confidence? Yeah. Uh -huh. 
No, I don't think it does. <laughs> good, because we're busting these I like that. No, that's there we good. go. Why? Uh, well, to, to Michelle's point, it's a very common narrative that came from the HP study, which said, you know, men applied at 60%, women at 100%. Therefore, women must suffer from confidence. And so I'm, I'm sure that all of us have suffered from self-doubt, women and men. Uh, but putting that aside for a moment, I find it fascinating that we only labeled the woman's behavior, right? We, we didn't talk about the man's behavior. We didn't talk about applying for 60% of the role. The only thing we labeled was the women's behavior, and we labeled it relative to the man's in a derogatory way. It became a confidence gap. It became something that women were less than or lacking in. And so as leaders, and, and actually even in that case, the worst thing is we probably lost the opportunity to place or advance the best talent, mm -hmm. because in many cases, they simply didn't apply. Yeah. So as leaders, as leaders in government, in organizations, in industry, whatever it is, we have a responsibility to broaden that definition of what does confidence look like? What does ambition look like? What is leadership? And we have to go beyond that simple prototype that we see most commonly, or that is rooted in often male behavior. Uh, and, and, you know, no malintent to the guys in the room, but we just, we're better than having a very singular definition uh, because we know that women and men behave differently. That's a really great thing, you know, that makes the world a wonderful, diverse place, but we can't label it. And so when we have such a narrow definition of leadership and when everything becomes labeled versus that, uh, then we lose the opportunity to... Uh, broaden the leadership that we have. And women are not less qualified, they are not less effective, they are not less confident, they're not less ambition, and they don't need fixing. We but just e need <laughs> to change the system. But uh, what, do you, what do you guys find? Uh, so I'm curious what you have found, because it seems to me we are culturally conditioned to not sort of flaunt our skills and say we're great. And I think that that sometimes shows up in the way we present ourselves to the outside world or to venture capitalists or to all, you know, our bosses. And, and for whatever reason, girls are culturally conditioned to not not be so braggy and full of themselves, right? I mean, what have you found, Sue Kender? I mean, I, I would say I think that my observation as somebody who is an angel investor in Silicon Valley and has raised money for my own companies is uh, when I get approached by a man and when I get approached by a woman, this is the difference I see, and I'll give, it, give you a personal anecdote. Um, I, got a, I got a business plan uh, d identifying that there was a multi-billion dollar category in sleep for children. Anybody who's in the room who's a mother knows this. Like, <laughs> you know that trying to get your children to sleep is, in fact, a difficult problem for most parents. Yep. I read the entire deck and was entirely, and it was in two male founders, was entirely convinced about the size of the market. I got to the last page and I still did not know what the solution was. At the end of the deck, I was convinced that this was a gigantic market. I was like, so how again does this replace the sleep nanny, this piece of technology? I don't even know what it is. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's example A. Example B, very dear friend of mine, uh, Ivy Business School grad, I'm Canadian, so I went to Ivy Business School, uh, X McKinsey, X, like all the name brands in tech, uh, becomes an entrepreneur, running an amazing company, her retention numbers are amazing, um, and yet when she went out to pitch for money, you know, she focused in her deck on the size of this small cohort and the retention number she had. And she failed to identify that there were several multi-billion dollar Chinese companies mm -hmm. globally um, going after the same market. So to her I said, look, you can choose to pitch this small or you can choose to big it, pitch it big. Mm -hmm. I typically see that when you're out raising money, you are competing on the strength of your ideas and the strength of your vision. And you both on day one have equal chances of success, and you both have very limited data. But I do sometimes find that, some that women want to pitch smaller, you know, and then, and then sort of do the big reveal once they have all the data. And men want to come in and tell you how big the market is, <laughs> whether they have any data <laughs> to support <laughs> that solution or not. So I will say, I say to everybody, look, this is whether you're male or whether you're a female, you are I, competing in an idea-driven economy. You do need to learn to pitch big. Yep. You do need to learn to vision big. You do need to learn to put out a, you know, idea into the world where, quite frankly, you're competing with a man, a woman, someone of every different ethnicity who's coming in right behind you and asking for dollars based on the size of their vision. That's true. And I, so I, I would that say uh, that labeling of, of women and girls as uh, needing attention, needing fixing, uh, isn't just hurting women and our 
uh, pursuit for equal opportunity, it is also hurting our sons. Because Absolutely. when we don't label the challenges Absolutely. that our boys are experiencing, we are creating a different kind of imbalance and that kind of gender inequality mm -hmm. hurts mm -hmm. us all. I would also add, you know, women aren't just women. Women live with disabilities and exceptionalities. They identify as queer. Some of them live in rural communities. Some live in urban. Some of them are refugees who have been raised by a single mom like me. And some of them are indigenous to this land. And their ancestors have been here all along. And when we talk about the challenges that they experience, when we talk about the opportunities that exist, when we talk about the perceptions that we have of ourselves and the way that we identify and the way those stereotypes or perceptions play out in broader society, it is so important to take into account all those realities and recognize that me, living in a r urban community, I have more opportunities and more privileges than somebody who's living in a rural community where the majority of the community speaks French, but they only speak English. And so as we're talking about this conversation around myths, around challenges with the pipeline, around confidence gaps and access to capital and opportunity, it's important to recognize the diversity that is woman. Yes, and, and absolutely. Caroline, conversely, when, when women act more like men, they sometimes get beaten down your latest ad campaign for Olay is telling women to own those things. You know, here is an example of too confident. We have that. Here's an example of too emotional. And here's an example, well, here's mm -hmm. too emotional. <laughs> and with too crossed out, and you'll explain why in a moment. Mm -hmm. Too outspoken, there's Lily Singh, who's Canadian too. I love Canadians, by the way. Did I mention <laughs> that? Um, anyway. Uh, so, so what were you trying to get across? You were saying embrace these these qualities that are sometimes seen as negatives in women. Yeah, and it's it's probably not seen as negative. The whole point of the campaign that the Olay team set out to do is that well, the two part is negative. Yes, that that women are too often told how to look, how to feel, or how to behave. And to Miriam's point, across every sort of intersectionality and the labels are even more acute my job from today that was to not use the word intersectionality so thank I'm you for using it I'm short cutting <laughs> i'm short cutting and so what the olay team set out to do is said we want women to be able to be their unapologetic selves mm -hmm. unapologetically true to themselves not live by what somebody else's opinion is and so it plays on this notion of what what might be seen as the way we would prefer people to be and okay. so the campaign takes all of these, there's nine beautiful, wonderful, inspiring women who have all identified that one thing that they were told they were too much of, and we cross that word out, and they just own that amazing individuality, uh, and that's what the campaign celebrates. So it's about face anything. These, uh, these women are remarkable. Okay, we have to move on to myth number three because uh, time is running out. Men are better suited for jobs in tech and finance. <laughs> Michelle, this is for you. There's a myth that guys are better for these jobs because I think it's related to this idea that boys are better at math and science than girls, something that is deeply ingrained in us as a culture. Yep. And Barbie, remember when the talking Barbie said, math is hard, that did not help. <laughs> yes. I was so annoyed by that doll. So, so so bust that myth for us, Michelle. Yeah, bust there, it good. There is, there is no question um, that women on every single level of aptitude that we can test are just as good at math and science. Christine and I were both talking about the fact that we were engineers. That does not mean we do not have progress to make on bringing women into STEM. And I think that there's a lot that goes behind this. I mean, it was I was a 10% women engineering class. We maybe made it to 20% in the last 10 years. And I think this is a lot about how we talk about uh, science and technology and share who the role models are, share all of the stories. I think Hidden Figures did more for science in the last year. And just right? reminding people what it means. By the and way, can I just tell a really quick yeah. story, Michelle? So I, um, I interviewed the woman who wrote Hidden Figures. Yeah. Years, and she said she knew it was a success when her friend, uh, who's African-American, was walking with her five-year-old down the street, and they saw three uh, African-American women walking down the street, and the little, little girl said, Mommy, look, astronaut. <laughs> oh, I thought that was the best story. 
But go ahead. I'm sorry. No, it's but it's it's exactly that. I mean, I think I did not make it into engineering because I was suggested. I was pushed heavily by my parents, which I'm incredibly happy they did that at an early age because I probably didn't know. But if we talk about science differently, I mean, women statistically always say they are more interested in careers that are helping people. Math and science do so much to change the whole world that we are going to live in in the future. And so it is about the way we talk about that, it is about the way we share those stories. And there is so much because this is, has nothing to do with an aptitude issue and everything to do with how we are inviting people. Into James that. Demore aside. And by the really? way, did you hear Christine Lagarde talking about how important it is as we become even increase more technological our with economy. artificial intelligence right. and yep. this who's is kind of controlling that database. But having yes. said that, you know, Carolyn, you're, you have a degree in computer science mm -hmm. and the number of people getting those degrees has steadily declined since the mid 1980s. Mm -hmm. So more people need to be like Michelle's parents who really <laughs> gave her a shot and said, you're going to no do options. this, right? <laughs> you go, so how girl. do we get more people yeah. to do that? And what do you, what's behind that decrease? Because I find that really troubling. Yeah, it's interesting, and, and I'm much older than Michelle, so <laughs> when I graduated, there were more women in, in computer science, and it has yeah. dropped off. It's like 24% in 2015, and much less for yeah. uh, women of color, uh, which is really unfortunate. It's this 10% mark is, is disturbing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think there's a couple of things. One is, and, and there's a ton of uh, press about this, and there's a lot to be done to address the cultural issues, yeah. and certainly people are working on that and I'm not as close to that. There's also a lot to be done, exactly as Michelle said, to encourage girls to study STEM. It's not an aptitude issue. It's not got nothing to do with capability, but as girls are in high school and they do very, very well in STEM, I, I think in a couple of cases, in a couple of ways, they see the world is so big and there are so many other options and we have to find a way to let them see themselves in STEM with the right role models and really encourage them to study it because they're more than capable. Uh, there was a, there's great effort in this area, GE, Microsoft, IBM, there's a number of companies, P&G, working to do that and really work to encourage girls to stay in s STEM and see themselves in the role models around and them. But also, Brita, Brita Kapoor, hold on two yes. seconds for two seconds, Marion, but Brita Kapoor, I know, uh, has done a lot of studies about the bro culture in tech. Yes. And some people yes. think the toxic culture is really preventing women from pursuing that as a career. Do you? Yes, so, uh, so I think that the, you know, the bro culture is certainly right now getting the attention that sort of makes people think it's not a welcome of place. But I want to actually bust one myth inside of what we just talked about. <laughs> the idea that you need to have an engineering degree to That's be in true. tech. I, I just want right. to, or to be an or to be an entrepreneur is another myth I want to break because you can find throughout tech whether it's the CEO of Twitter, the CEO of Airbnb, Sheryl YouTube. Sandberg, yeah. you will find Susan Wojcicki who runs YouTube. You will find numerous examples of people who are not holding to engineering degree. So I think the key point here is design thinking and training our children to be makers. That's an Because I think point. makership yeah. is, what is, an, is what is needed. That's a really important point. Miriam, I'm sorry I interrupted. What were you uh, gonna say? Governments play a role in this. It's why our governments investing so that we have more women like the women around here entering STEM fields because that's how we grow the economy. That's where the jobs of the future are. We have a labor shortage, for example, in manufacturing right now. About half a million jobs in Canada have gone unfilled this year. It's an increase of about 20% over the last year alone. That's leaving money on the table, and that is something that government, in partnership with the private sector, in partnership with parents and families and role models, can move, along, uh, move uh, forward significantly. Well, unfortunately, that's going to have to be the last <laughs> words. Sue Kender, Michelle, Miriam, and Carolyn, thank you all thank so you. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.